I have the honor of having Professor Dr. Monica Zinn with me today, who is a, a professor of Indology and Indian Art in University of uh, Munich. She is uh, uh, quite well known in the area of Buddhist studies uh, of, of the early and mainstream Buddhism uh, in India. And now she has, in the last 10 years or, or, or more, she has moved towards Central Asia. Her work in Central Asia, Central Asian art, is widely being recognized as a uh, milestone and pivotal. Prior to that, her work was focused on Ajanta and she published uh, two works, which is, uh, uh, in my personal opinion, as a student of Indian art, uh, her work in 2003 was uh, a guide to Ajanta paintings. Uh, that includes uh, the drawings of the Ajanta paintings because many of the uh, paintings are now in such poor state of preservation that even with the naked eye we are not able to see the details. So it is her uh, hard work through which she drew each uh, of, uh, and every devote, devotional, uh, ornamental as well as narratives. So it is of great help to the uh, student of Indian art. And uh, that her next work uh, was in German uh, called Sansar Chakra, which, which, which is of, of immense importance, the entire book on, on one single theme of Sansar Chakra, of K, uh, the left wall of Cave 17. And, and thereafter, she has compiled a work uh, on multiple volumes uh, which is called Handbook, uh, uh, which is a sequel to Professor Schindler's publication. It is under publication right now. So with this very brief introduction, I would now like to talk with her on the subject of Ajanta. And uh, I must not forget to also underline that she is one of the four or five uh, leading subjects experts today, widely regarded, and her views, I personally as a student, as a learner, uh, I give, I have much to learn from her. So therefore now, if I may begin to ask you, uh, first question, how did Ajanta attract your attention? Thank you, Rajesh, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, how Ajanta came to my mind? Actually, my parents in my childhood went for the first time to Ajanta. I told me about that, and I had absolutely no idea that, like, 20 years after, I would come in Germany and meet Professor Schlinglow, and he took me as assistant. And from this moment, I was just involved into Ajanta and had to. When was that? Or that. That was in Munich, University of Munich, beginning of the 90s, when I was done with my PhD in Indology. And um, Schlinglov got to know, oh, she also studied art history and can draw, so maybe <laughs> let us work together. And from this moment, we were working together, what we are still doing till today. <laughs> when and why did this idea of making drawings of Ajanta came to your mind? It wasn't my idea. That was um, Professor Schlingler started with that, um, with Matthias Helmdach, so that was before my time. And um, after that, I uh, redraw um, Helmdach's uh, drawings. And I did many by myself, first for uh, Schlingler's books, uh, after for my books. So. There's something really very, very peculiar about making drawings. Um, you cannot hire somebody and, and say, just, just, just make drawings, because um, you can draw only what you know about. Mm. Uh, when you expect uh, something, you must know the story, so you, you can find uh, particular details of the story in that. Of course, 
you need um, good uh, pictures, uh, good photographs to, to make it. And um, only today I know from your own pictures, you recognize so many tiny details, uh, which I could, I, I just did not have good basis to make good drawings sometimes. So uh, <laughs> you had to first uh, uh, do the photography work before? Sometimes, sometimes from um, publications, different publications, and um, of enormous importance uh, were copies. Yeah. Copy uh, by Griffiths or yeah by Griffiths. Um, actually, they were not by Griffiths by uh, by his students from James G. 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 Mm. Bay School of Art and. Um, these uh, drawings from which we have a set of black and white photographs uh, at our institute in Munich, um, that was really the most important, it was really essential. Because um, paintings um, in 1880s um, were in much better state of preservation as they are today. So. Because I have observed your drawings you have you have not left anything even things that are not visible now clearly with high-end camera or lenses but still you have been able to draw it and yeah. identify how yeah. did you manage that it's a really heavy job <laughs> that's a very heavy yeah. job but uh, sometimes for one drawing you need uh, a week or longer to uh, recognize that to look into um, Descriptions, for example, because we also have uh, descriptions of, uh. of them. So, um, and um, when you enlarge, when you, mm. I have my own techniques to work uh, with Photoshop. When mm. I sometimes uh, change everything into pink, you can see um, uh. more details. Oh. Than, but I'm trained on mm. that, and um, I was doing that 10 years, so after a while you really know how to work. So it's easy for me to, to recognize um, uh, groups of mm. people and, and when you know that the text also, so you know how to arrange, that there's absolutely nothing in the drawings, only taking from my fantasy, that mm. I know this should be Hansa, so I draw the Hansa, mm. definitely not. But uh, sometimes you just see a little bit of, of the beak of Hansa, mm -hmm. so you can, you can recognize the rest as well. With Ajanta, after having done this meticulous, this painstaking, this laborious work and this fruitful work, how is it that now suddenly you decided to move away to another area of expertise? This is not the end of Ajanta research, what we made, this is the beginning. Mm -hmm. We just delivered um, the state what we have and the best as possible we could give explanation of them. Um, but only now people should start with the research. And when we can say hand of 10 or, or more stories that um, in Ajanta this is how you represent uh, Crown Prince, this is how you represent uh, the minister. Mm. So only now we can really start with the research and uh, go into depth and, and search uh, after more details and maybe also find another explanation of paintings. Uh, so often we say um, it is probably like that because we don't know anything better, but uh, maybe one day we will we'll have better ideas how to explain it. Now, since you are working mm. in Central Asia, Central Asian Buddhist art, uh, what connection you, you, you find between Ajanta and Central Asia? Is there any direct connection? Do you think? It is direct connection, mm. um, which really surprised us. This is a research uh, still ongoing and running, so we don't have um, ready answers. Uh, for the time being, um, the idea is that uh, it was a time um, after 500, we don't really, maybe one generation earlier, maybe later, but around, let's say, around 500 AD, uh, what we try to uh, call 
Pax Heftaliana, where the Heftalites came um, from Central Asia, and it was a time when they were in Bactria, when they were in uh, in today's what we call Gandhara, uh, Central Asia, my Kucha mm. <laughs> region, and also part of India. And during this time, directly from Central India, not only from Gandhara, but directly from places like like Ajanta, for example. Uh, Direct uh, influences could come to to, uh, to the to the paintings of Central Asia, because um, well, we are talking about Ajanta because we have Ajanta, mm. but Ajanta survived; other places did not. Uh, so we just have to be aware of that. Uh, they were probably. Many such Ajantas, maybe not hundreds, but many places with wonderful paintings and Ajanta survived. But uh, it is still um, a sort of um, aesthetics. We have only in India and we don't have in Gandhara, for example. And there is also sort of um, different uh, literary sources which were uh, illustrated in Ajanta and not in Gandhara. In Gandhara, uh, we have not so we do have uh, Jatakas, but not so many, and really not popular uh, were um, Jatakas about uh, animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Kucha, um, in Central Asian paintings on the on the northern Silk Road, um, they are like seventy Jatakas. So mm -hmm. you can uh, compare it actually with Barut uh, much more than and definitely and or with Ajanta. So plenty of, of Jataka stories, many of them uh, illustrating uh, the Bodhisattva like, like the animal, mm. like the monkey or, or elephant um, or bird. And all these stories are represented in Central Asia as well. And sometimes we see direct connections uh, between uh, Ajanta and Central Asia. Like um, like in Vanara Jataka, you will know that mm. uh, from Cave 17. Um, the monkey in Vanara is lying there and uh, somebody is trying to kill him, keeping a stone above the head. And the monkey is lying on the side of the pond and there is a tree uh, behind him. So there are so many possibilities to show somebody is killing a monkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is exactly how we have it uh, represented in, in mm -hmm. Kucha. So they must have been direct connections. We have several examples mm -hmm. like that. And uh, sometimes also coming not only from Ajanta, but uh, what we know from, from uh, Andra school. So, um, the influences were definitely there, and also in terms of dating. Um, we have this difficult gap, uh, because uh, narrative art in, in uh, Gandhara stops like 300 AD, and uh, paintings in Kucha start probably like around 470 or something, not, not much earlier. So what was in between? And this is this 470 is really corresponds much better with Ajanta and corresponds with mm. uh, with Gandhara. So we definitely have these direct connections, uh, and also in point of, of aesthetics, um, dark red. Uh, uh, Everything is actually in these early paintings in, in Kucha uh, dominates uh, dark red color. It's it like in, in, in Ajanta, so that, mm -hmm. that must be this. Or we have like um, tiny flowers everywhere mm -hmm. on the ground, which is, um, they were repeating the, the, the same uh, shapes, the same um, mm -hmm. way of depicting stories. Also that um, with groupings of um, scenes playing in the same place, um, not chronologically, um, but in, in groupings uh, according to to, uh, to locations. So they were really prototypes are coming from uh, places like Ajanta, maybe not directly from Ajanta, but from places like that. Before that, I should like to pose the, uh, uh, another question. Just that of the two phases that Ajanta has, how do you date the, the first phase? For me, it's uh, Satavahana time. Um, I would say it's first century uh, BCE, 
Mm, first century or second century? For me, first century. Second for century. me, first century, um, contemporary to, to um, Sanchi. Um, so this is this time. <laughs> Have you found that there is a some direct connection between Kanaganhalli and uh, Ajanta earlier phase? Yeah, sure. sure. And what are, what are these connections? Let us start with um, similarities mm -hmm. uh, of um, of representation of what what uh, women are wearing, of furniture, of uh, how um, how what objects look like. Um, so uh, you will um, because connections and similarities between uh, Sanchi Sanchi One Great Great Stupa uh, and Ajanta Ten are mm -hmm. probably quite uh, well known. And so the same way we can also find another connections between um, uh, Ajanta 10 and 9 and uh, Kanaganahari. Yeah, Ajanta is sort of um, uh, revolutionary in point of uh, history, uh, in Buddhology, because for the very first time we have uh, Buddha's life story represented uh, in several together uh, Buddhist scenes in uh, uh, cave 10 on the left wall, um, which we do not have uh, in uh, Sanchi, only separate scenes, uh, and which we don't really have even after, um, but in Ajanta, this really particular uh, representation is still there. Is there, <laughs> is there for the first time. But um, what is um, it's difficult to say what was earlier, what was later. We don't have uh, nativity in, in uh, Sanchi. Uh, we do have in Ajanta Ten, and we do have in uh, um, Kanaganahari. But now, what is earlier? Because um, in Ajanta, Maya is standing there, is keeping a branch of the tree, mm. but this characteristic gesture and that she's standing like Shala Banjika mm. is still not there. I would say still not there. One, it was established, it was repeated. Mm. And we have it in Kanaganahari. There, Maya is standing like mm. <laughs> it should be, mm. <laughs> like it should be with, a, with one arm holding uh, a tree, Shala tree. Mm. Shala tree, so it's... Um, in this point, the tradition was born and is going to, to be repeated. So now is the question, what was earlier? Mm. Kanaganahari with um, iconography, which is mm. going to be repeated, uh, or Ajanta, where the tree is there, but Maya is mm. still standing and it's different direction somehow. <laughs> I'm not sitting properly, <laughs> but, but um, it's not, not, not there. Satavahanas uh, themselves, they were not Buddhist. And what kind of people uh, they must have been? I mean, we are told that there were some 16 schools of Buddhism in well, the early times. And uh, so, what is your idea? What 9 and 10 tells you about the early? You mean this, this uh, in the Satavahana times? Yes. In Ajanta 9 and 10, um, we have. Um, two really important paintings, more important than anything else, in terms of um, affiliation with the school. Mm. Because uh, behind the uh, stupa in Cave 10, where it's completely dark, where it's completely dark, I recognize that there the story, which was one of the most difficult identifications ever. I was there taking pictures, even the camera had difficulty to, to recognize anything. <laughs> I could switch uh, on just my please, dear camera, take pictures even if you cannot see anything. And from these uh, pictures, um, with help of Photoshop, I still could recognize something. And uh, after several weeks of work, uh, I have a drawing of, of the uh, wall before. Uh, why it is of such importance? Uh, this is the story about Shyamavati and uh, Udayana, uh, which was depicted uh, in, uh, in Andhra several times. Um, we have uh, in Amaravati several times depiction of that. So what's so interesting about the story? Um, there is the story about Pius uh, Shyamavati, 
wife of Udayana. And this Udayana, the king of uh, Kaushambi, had also another wife. And she was non-Buddhist and she was bad. Mm. And, <laughs> mm. so, um, and she hated the good mm. one, mm. the pious Shyamalati. Mm. Uh, so in several um, uh, really ugly uh, acts, uh, she tried to uh, convince Kim, uh, the king, to kill mm. the bad wife. Mm. So we have um, a series of uh, representations uh, in, uh, in Andhra, uh, when the bad wife, Anupama was her, mm. her name, put a snake mm. into the vena of the king. Mm. And then she said, oh, Yamavati, who wants mm. to, to kill the king? The king takes a bow and arrow and shoots three arrows on, on her. Mm. But she was a Buddhist, mm. so she radiated a feeling of Maitri mm. and the arrows fall down. Mm. So that was the story how it is uh, illustrated in, in the South. Mm. And Behind the stupa in Ajanta 10, there's definitely the same story. We have the king shooting arrows, we have Shyamavati, but we do not have the Veena. Mm. And when I recognized the rest of, uh, of the paintings there, uh, it was easy to find when you, when you do already the job, so you, you can recognize that, uh, that there was a person with birds. The, the bird here, and uh, somebody carrying also uh, something like, like a cage. Mm. No vena person with, with bird and, and a cage. So when you start um, to search after um, literary basis, the basis is there. It's the same story, but um, the kings had different motivation to uh, show to the Shyamalati. So this bad wife, um, uh, Anupama said, Majesty, she cooked for the Buddha, mm. the bird, and she refused to cook for you. So that was the king started to, to shock. Uh, the story behind was that, of course, uh, Shyamalati had invited the community of, uh, of the Buddha and his, um, his monks, and somebody delivered to her dead birds. Mm. So she cooked a dish out of it. And after that, somebody delivered her alive. So mm. living animals, living uh, birds. Mm. So like uh, good Upasika, of course, she sent them to heaven. <laughs> she sent them, she let them free. And um, so that's what that bad wife did not say to, to, to the king. Um, with this knowledge, um, we can be absolutely positive that this is uh, this story, not another one. And this story we know today from Divya Vadana and Mula Sarvastivadin. So that's the first example which really connects really this early tradition uh, with Mula Sarvastivadin. And this is not the only one. In Ajanta 9, on the right side, on the right side wall, just on the very beginning, uh, there is also a very difficult to, to read uh, a painting. It took me a long time to, to recognize that. But this is also a story about, um, uh, this is a story about the snake. That's um, a story about um, uh, Elapatra, uh -huh. Elapatra uh, story. And also for this, we have two different um, versions. The southern one, which survived in, in Pali sources, and the northern one. Um, the Pali is depicted uh, in um, Barut. And the northern, which is again illustrated in uh, Ajanta, mm. uh, we know again from Mula Sarvastivada tradition, uh, survived today, um, as far as I remember, only in, in or maybe not, maybe we still have fragments in Sanskrit, but mostly entire uh, stories in Tibetan and Chinese mm. sources. So um, what does it mean? It's actually really difficult to, to, to say it, um, because um, our knowledge about Buddhism, uh, we are not aware that this 
partitions of of uh, of the school was so early and in so early times uh, connected with special geographic uh, areas so i can only say ajanta paintings illustrate stories known from version which survived till today from Divya Vadana, which is much uh, hundreds of years uh, later. Mm. But um, it is like it is. Mm. Uh, and for Ajanta, like uh, geographical uh, setting, um, this is exactly this Mula Sarvastivadin, which is going to be really of importance for, for later times uh, in the 5th century. That was a leading school, most of uh, representations you can find um, um, literary basis in, in Mula Sarvastivada tradition. So how many such examples do we find? I mean, this is one, uh, two examples you recall. In the, in, the, uh, in the earlier time. Uh -huh. yeah. are, there, are there many such examples? Well... There were Mool Sarvastivadin and no other sects? Well, the presence of Mool Sarvastivadin could be thus inferred, but how do we infer that we did not have other sects there? We do not. Like for for the Buddha life story in, in Ajanta 10, um, there is um, a representation of Maya giving birth, as I, I, I said before, so this nativity. And there is um, definitely one god taking the Buddha, receiving the Buddha. So this is also like in, in, in the northern tradition, uh, that's Indra, not uh, four kings of direction, what we have represented in, in uh, southern uh, stories. So, uh, however, we, it's difficult to, to say about particular school affiliations, but what we really can say, um, it's, it is connected much more with um, schools, um, texts we know today that they are in, in uh, Sanskrit or, or well, hybrid Sanskrit, uh, not in Pali. The reason why I'm asking, like, mm. like in Andhra, we had upper shailas who were uh, upper shailas yeah. who were more predominant. So if we find some connection with Andhra in this Advana period, then would it? Then how come we do not have the upper shailas here? Other than Mm, we have to search for. <laughs> we have to search. Uh, the difficulty is that we do not have text of Aparamahavira Shailas or Inchetikas. The text did not survive. So what we have uh, is our knowledge that they were there, and we have depictions in in. Uh, so for the earlier phase, uh, like norm normally conventionally, traditionally, mm. we say it's Hinayana, you know. Yeah. So, is it okay for you, or should we call no, 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 Mula uh, We cannot say for sure. First of all, we really don't know um, how old Mula Sarvastivada is. Maybe we should call it Sarvastivada for, for this mm. early. We don't know if uh, Vinaya existed already in this time. Um, Hinayana is also difficult, Shravakayana, mm -hmm. or, but uh, however you call it, it's a label, and um, so we understand what we are talking about. And um, so early Buddhist, early, early time uh, in opposition to, to Mahayana and this pantheon of um, bodhisattvas and so on. So. That's what we are talking about. So Ajanta is actually definitely early Ajanta, but probably also the, the fifth century Ajanta, not so Mahayanistic as we actually would like to have it. Coming to the uh, fifth century phase, this fifth century is like a cobweb of problems. And uh, the theory such I wanted to know that how do we explain the distinct gamut of paintings that we see in the 5th century AD. More particularly, I would like to know, why do we not see Bodhisattva when the 5th century begins? Bodhisattva in Ajanta, in any form, comes at the very end, very last years of the 5th century development. We Bodhisattva are totally absent Ajanta. In the, even in the 5th century AD. <laughs> it is only in the last years when the Bodhisattvas start coming. 
what about them uh, who belong to, to the program? Because I really think the, the one in um, Agenda 17, in the, uh, the veranda, uh, on the left side, where is this uh, Sansara Chakra, uh, the Bodhisattva there really belongs to the program. I'm absolutely convinced to that that this is entire what is really great and uh, I admire Waters Pink for that. He did fantastic work uh, just making um, a distinction between the program of the caves and intrusions. It is really a milestone. It's really so important of his uh, of his research. So we have the program and the program of Ajanta uh, to my mind, maybe it's just not the last word, but to my mind, um, this um, working on uh, pre-meditated design uh, of uh, narrative representation. There is some intrusive class yeah. of work are different. That comes in the, in the that when the the cave space is supposed are, to be abandoned. Yeah. Even in the programmed segment, these bodhisattvas, as these, these are so of course programmed, but mm. they come in the very late phase, yeah. or not in the very first year of painting. In cave mm. number six above, there are so many shrines. In the cave number six, upper six has as many as six shrines. But you in cave number remember. six, you have something absolutely great, mm. um, you know, where is a miniature representation of two bodhisattvas. One is. Uh, like Avalokiteshvara with scenes uh, around, like the, this uh, saver from, from Paris. And another one is one of, um, of the bodhisattvas we, uh, with different genies mm, what we yeah, have yeah. Uh, on the entrances. We're talking Ajanta. about the lower six, not the upper six. Cave six, six is two story. Yeah, upper six. Upper, upper six. six. Ah, in the upper six. Um, I have some pictures actually. I, I in the shrine show. and the chamber? No, no, in the, on the veranda. In the veranda? On the veranda. I'm really afraid these paintings disappeared in recent years. So maybe my painting, my uh, pictures taken like 20 years ago, maybe <laughs> that's the only representation mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is actually, uh, the painting is uh, of importance, um, was actually the only reason why I still call this great representations of the kings of the rocks, mm. uh, rocks um, landscapes mm. uh, surrounded by different genies. I still call them bodhisattva kings. I was really not not. But when I found this extremely bad uh, survived uh, preserved paintings uh, in Ajanta Six, uh, where. One such bodhisattva was placed next to Avalokiteshvara, so they were sort of equal. Mm -hmm. Same big and just on, on, uh, on one wall. Uh, minute but wonderfully painted. Um, so that still makes me feeling okay that uh, also these bodhisattvas, these kings of, uh, of landscapes, uh, probably they have also a value of, uh, of a bodhisattva. Why would these bodhisattvas be like, look, they don't, they, they don't have jata mukut, they have They have nothing, mukut. they have absolutely and nothing. Why, why, when he's a bodhisattva, why because, is he um, so like a <laughs> prince, he's dressed like a yeah. like... Bodhisattvas always are dressed like a prince in Gandhara and everywhere, so that this is not, not the point. Um, but Ajanta seems to be just on the... Uh, as a turning point, um, mm. because we have a very old tradition to put, um, uh, first of all, rocky mountains on the entrances, mm. not only in Buddhist tradition, mm. but uh, really everywhere, uh, which seems to me to be very Indian, pan-Indian uh, representation, how you, how you go into sanctuary. There is this wonderful uh, so-called Parvati uh, temple in Nashna Kutara, uh, where um, there's a temple on the on the plinth, and outside was really like 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 a rocks. Uh, today it was a little niche, uh, but when you uh, read old uh, reports, there were also different. Um, uh, mm whoever, uh, Kinaras and, and so on, <laughs> sitting mm -hmm. in there. Uh, so, 
when you want to go to the temple, you have to cross uh, the mountains. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you read Mahabharata or whatever, somebody who, who wants to go to the gods has to cross Himalaya mm -hmm. because uh, gods sit on, on uh, Sumeru and so on another side. You, when you want to reach, you read the gods, you cross Himalaya. Uh, so that might have been uh, this sort of stereotype that they did. Yeah, and extremely Structured. old topo, mm -hmm. topos, how mm -hmm. you go there. And uh, you have it on the entrance of so many, like in, in uh, Sanji 3, you go to, to, to the enclave of the stupa, on the top um, you have representations of, of different uh, gods oh, and, and Nagas and, and Yakshas and Hariti or whoever. And just, you are crossing that, you are coming into, from the profane uh, world into Sanctum, this is the border, you cross Himalaya. Uh, so, this, the representation of the mountains uh, on the entrances, I really see in, in this tradition. Uh, so, these wonderful kings of, um, on the entrances to Ajanta, they were explained like bodhisattvas. Mm. They were explained like um, Sukhavati, mm. like paradise, uh, paradises, um, uh, which actually cannot be of one point. Um, in Sukhavati, there are no mountains. Mm. <laughs> And it's also, so cold, but never. <laughs> Shabaras will not be there. These, uh, these, uh, yeah. hunt, uh, the inhabitants of the jungle will not be there. Earthly inhabitants. Yeah. So that's mm. uh, that's mm. topos uh, in Indian, uh, pan-Indian thinking in in all uh, religion. Take Kalidasa and uh, descriptions of Kumara Zambava. Mm. What is going on in Himalaya? You have just such different kinaras. You have ladies mm. with with uh, horses. Uh, mm heads and you have Shabaras and you have everybody. So this is uh, where the gods are coming and um, no people, only Shabaras. Only Shabaras were there, mm. which is really yeah. extremely interesting. <laughs> that comes from. <laughs> and, uh, Yours, in my, in my personal view, as far as I have studied Ajanta and other authors, your identification and explanation of this Bodhisattva king in the mountainous landscape <laughs> is so beautiful. Yeah. No one noticed before that this is something that we see uh, on the axis of the ent on the axis of the cave. First yeah. we see on the other side on the porch. Then we see uh, on the other side of the uh, the hall, the oh. rear wall of the hall. Then we see on the antechamber. Exactly. Because there were also different um, uh, mm. whoever uh, kinaras and, and so on <laughs> sitting mm. in there. Uh, so. When you want to go to the temple, you have to cross uh, the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, when you read Mahabharata or whatever, somebody who, who wants to go to the gods has to cross Himalaya mm -hmm. because uh, gods sit on, on uh, Sumeru and so on another side. You, when you want to reach, you read the gods, you cross Himalaya. Uh, so that might have been uh, this sort of the stereotype that they did. Yeah, mm. and extremely Structured. old topo, mm. topos, how mm. you go there. Mm. And uh, you have it on the entrance of so many, like in, mm. in uh, Sanji 3. You go to, to, to the enclave of the stupa, on the top um, you have representations of, of different uh, forests and, 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 and Nagas and, and Yakshas and Hariti or whoever. And just you are crossing that, you are coming into from the profane uh, world into the sanctum, this is the border, you cross Himalaya. Uh, so this, the representation of the mountains uh, on the entrances, I really see in, in this tradition. Uh, so these wonderful kings of, um, on the entrances to Ajanta, they were explained like bodhisattvas. Mm. They were explained like um, Sukhavati, mm. like paradise, uh, paradises, um, uh, which actually cannot be of one point. Um, mm. In Sukhavati, there are no mountains. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> also, Sukhavati also never. this Shabaras will not be there. Yeah. These, uh, these uh, yeah. hunt, uh, the uh, inhabitants of the jungle will not be there. Earthly inhabitants. Yeah. So that's mm. uh, that's mm. topos uh, in Indian. Mm. Uh, 
pan-Indian thinking in, in all uh, religion, take Kalidasa and uh, description of Kumara Zambava, mm -hmm. what is going on in Himalaya, you have just such different Kinaras, you have ladies mm -hmm. with, with uh, horses uh, mm -hmm. heads, and you have Shabaras, and you have everybody. So this is uh, where the gods are coming, and um, no people, only Shabaras. Mm -hmm. Shabaras were there, mm -hmm. which is really... The extremely interesting. <laughs> Your identification and explanation of this Bodhisattva walking in the mountainous landscape <laughs> is so beautiful. Yeah. No one noticed before that this is something that we see uh, on the axis of the ent on the axis of the cave. First yeah. we see on the other side on the porch, then we see uh, on the other side of the uh, the hall, the yeah. rear wall of the hall, then we see on the antechamber. We have hundreds of yakshas and mm. uh, hundreds of uh, representations of the Buddha and or Jatakas or whatever, but only in Ajanta we see how they were placed together mm. and we mm. can follow that they were really next to each other. The Buddha next to Hariti or um, Yakshas or, or whatever. Uh, and um, that uh, brings us uh, in really difficult position because um, I would say nobody would expect something like this. Mm. Uh, that um, the preaching Buddhas and uh, a representation which uh, should be good for uh, for your way to, to enlightenment, for mm. your way to Nirvana, are represented um, next to the yakshas or uh, tiny symbolical representations with uh, pots. Um, Giving, Shankamidi, uh, Shankamidi Padmanidi. giving uh, uh. coins uh, or different uh, wonderful cows and uh, pots with, with running coins on the side. Uh, how does it work together? And um, I must say that was a huge problem uh, for me when I was working already many years ago on this uh, book about um, devotional and ornamental paintings. Uh, that was as a matter of fact, really surprised mm -hmm. uh, because um, I was sure we are here in uh, Buddhist sanctuary, so that everything must must be Buddhist, and it is um, really, in certain extent, absolutely not the case. Yeah, we have the sort of imagery which is not um, intended um, into Nirvana. It is not for somebody seeking for, for enlightenment, but uh, this is for life today. Having healthy children, having success in, in, uh, in business, having uh, good money. And um, so there are completely different um, objects, completely different way of, of imagery. Um, and uh, also difficulties how to, how to name them. Uh, you cannot say they are profane, because mm. Kubera is the god. Yakshas are also divinities. They are not so important like, like the Buddha and the Dharma, but you cannot say that's mm. just that's a profane word. Mm. Uh, so I started with um, to, to name, just to, to give labels to these uh, two groups, uh, representations relevant uh, mm -hmm. for enlightenment and irrelevant for enlightenment. And I think this is exactly that, that's, that points to this. Mm -hmm. There are also divinities um, and uh, important for, for, for worship, but the worship um, can guarantee you that you will reach with your caravan the next city, that uh, your wife will bring during uh, your absence uh, healthy children to, to, mm -hmm. to this world. Uh, so simply speaking, who is um, seeking for nirvana should not bring children to this world and should be interested in, in staying in the uh, monastery and not uh, making money. So they are just, um, it is against the doctrine Mm. Uh, definitely, but it's very human. And this also, to my mind, uh, show us for whom uh, these monasteries were really made. 
Um, they must have been traders uh, on the world who were expecting these uh, representations. And uh, when in, in cave two we have the central Buddha in the main uh, shrine and on one side we have deities responsible for healthy children and on another side responsible for money, it tells us a lot and the shrines are not necessarily less important. Mm -hmm. And what we definitely should not do is to ignore this part. It was same important like everything else. And um, also it belongs to the same way of uh, imagery uh, of, of these people. Uh, what role did narrative programs play in the overall aesthetic and functions yeah. of the art? There are narrative representations with uh, scenes from the life of the Buddha with um, stories like Nanda or Purna, so stories about playing during a time, um, lifetime of the Buddha, but with the main person uh, being not the Buddha, but somebody from of his uh, contemporaries, or the Jataka. Mm -hmm. So all these narratives are represented on the uh, side walls and front walls in, in, uh, of the veranda and in the, in the main uh, hall. Uh, Directly by the uh, entrances where these uh, bodhisattvas, we were talking about them uh, before, uh, whom I actually rather see like, like kings of um, um, rocky landscapes. Mm -hmm. uh, they are surrounded by uh, different, uh, different deities. And uh, when we go farther uh, towards the sanctuary, uh, we notice that only there are really representations of the Buddha, mm -hmm. before they were not there. So that there were narratives, but the Buddha or the Bodhisattvas were not represented there. Mm -hmm. So we have in the um, in this weight into to the chamber, we have uh, representation which are just in between. The Buddha is in the middle and um, around uh, still narratives like mm. Mara Vijaya. There's one Buddha, but Mara is coming, Mara is fighting, Mara is defeated. So that's the, around is, is the narration depicted. Or the Buddha is coming from, from uh, um, Trayastrimsha heaven. So, and uh, it is like in between. Uh, the iconic representation was one Buddha with central uh, central Buddha and uh, still narrative. And the next step is sanctuary with one Buddha preaching or meditating in, in, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary. Uh, what we see now when you come to the, um, to the um, cave, uh, caves you will see a lot of the Buddhas. But this is what Walter Sting find out. This many Buddhas are intrusions. They are intrusions, so you just have to forget about that. So, uh, to my mind, um, as, as we see it uh, together with Professor Schlingler now, they must have been two different, um, how to say, that this program. This mm. program was probably. Uh, Premeditatedly, uh, premeditating, um, prepared by um, a land monk, who probably was Mula Sarvastivadin. Mm -hmm. If entire um, sanctuary or monasteries were also for Sarvastivadin, it's another story. But there was somebody who was instructing the, the painting uh, painters mm -hmm. how to, to make the, these representations. And because most of the paintings really follows this Mula Sarvastivada tradition, it was probably that. If that was just one person or many, we just don't know about it. Uh, but that must have been somebody who was just preparing this. Um, order where to, to put somewhere. And the order is there. There are Jatakas, there, is, there are stories from the Buddha and so on and so on. Uh, especially in Cave 16, it started to be so um, visible. Mm. When you have um, the representation of Buddha life story in 31 uh, uh, scenes, episodes, 
Um, from Tushita heaven till the first uh, sermon, but two most important scenes are not mm -hmm. represented. This is an enlightenment and the first sermon. They are just not there and never were there. Probably the viewer was expecting mm. they should not be between narrative representation. Mm. They belong to the area of the sanctum. Mm. So they were like we have them in, in cave six, in, just on the side um, uh, of the entrance to, to the antechamber, or we have in uh, cave one in the antechamber. So this um, on the just turning into an iconic representation, they, they belong somewhere else. And we don't have them in, in the main cave. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, what you can observe, uh, to my mind, it is coming from, from uh, Andran art, when actually every um, freeze, there is a central Buddha, and you have Jatakas or seen from the life of the Buddha, which always make. Um, that's ne never just by, by chance, or they they always correspond with the central Buddha. So this is um, really a plan, mm. um, also realized in in, uh, in the caves uh, of Ajanta. That was uh, uh, Professor Monica Zinn who told us about many of the unknown or lesser known secrets of Ajanta. Thank you so Thank much, you. Monica. Thank you for inviting me here. <laughs>